we live in a reality of uh, instant ratifications. And, and most TED Talks I've seen, they start in the beginning and there is some kind of a punchline in the end. I decided to reverse and just start the talk from the end. So neither it's going to be a really short talk or we'll see how we build it. Ten years from now, Bulgaria is going to be ranked in the top five European countries when it comes to GDP. Yes. <laughs> Continue with that reaction, please. <laughs> 20 years from now, 20 of the top Fortune 100 companies will have their main R&D centers in Bulgaria. 30 years from now, the Bulgarian model is going to be what we consider the Silicon Valley model today. Everyone will try to copy the Bulgarian model 30 years from now. Now, raise your hand if you think I'm crazy. <laughs> is it so bad to be crazy? I mean, is it reality driven by crazy people? Now, those who raise your hand, did you raise your hand out of your heart or out of your, out of your head? Because look into your heart and raise your hand if you wish that to be the reality 30 years from now in Bulgaria. All right? Let me give you a little bit of uh, context. Many years ago, I fell in love with a Bulgarian woman. And after all, Bulgarian women are ranked some of the most beautiful women in the world. And Soon after, I fell in love with Bulgaria, and seriously, they, what not to love? And when I tell people that, you know, my family left Sweden, the so-called most perfect place in the universe, and moved to Bulgaria, I get this lifted eyebrow, you know, tilted of the head, and a very strange look. Wait. <laughs> I mean, I get this like, what the fuck, isn't Bulgaria the most poorest country in the European Union? Checked. Do they have electricity? They do. <laughs> they do. Not always, but they do. <laughs> Bulgarian people are very unhappy. They like to complain a lot. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking back in the eyes of these people, and, and I'm like, you know, what the hell do you know about Bulgaria? And, and I'm asking you, what does the world know about Bulgaria? And, and it's, it's old. It's really old. It's, 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 the, you know, it's hosting two of the most oldest cities on the planet. It's never, it, Bulgaria never changed its name. It's the only European country that never, never changed its name since the day it was established. Raina Kasavova paved the way of being the first woman to ever participate in a military flight. Spartacus, now some people will debate on that, but Spartacus is from Trakia. And Trakia is Bulgaria. That's it. And, and here is a, a non-hypothetical question for you. What else doesn't the world know about Bulgaria? Really not hypothetical, you have to shout it. <laughs> the Bulgarian alphabet. Rakia. Rakia. <laughs> Absolutely. What else? What else? Hello? Come on, you're, you're living here. <laughs> Yogurt, right? The first digital wristwatch, wristwatch. The first digital computer, right? Let's not forget the automatic transmission for automotive is a Bulgarian invention. So how come Bulgaria is the most unbranded place in Europe? What? How do we rebrand it? And, and this is what I see when I look at Bulgaria. <laughs> Yes, I know. <laughs> Everyone is innovative when it comes not to pay for parking. <laughs> Everyone. But that, that simply shows me that you know how to navigate and to innovate around a broken system. <laughs> yes, you love to complain. You do. But you always do it on a cup of coffee. <laughs> always. That shows me that in a world that is addicted to dopamine, serotonin is such an important drive of the society in Bulgaria. And when I see kids in other places around the world, on the same table sits 
and they message each other with the phone. I'm sorry, I don't see that in Bulgaria. And serotonin is one of the most important building blocks for creativity, for humanity, for sustainability and resilience. And we should never, never let go of that in Bulgaria. I see a place where digital nomad choose to go. No one is forcing them. And they, when I'm talking to a lot of nomads, they're saying, it's really cheap to live in Bulgaria. Don't give up on that. You talked about currencies, right? <laughs> Keep it like that, because whenever digital nomad travel to a place and settle down, they drive economic prosperity. How do we harness that? I see a place, I'm, I'm walking around and I'm talking to a lot of companies. Can I meet your developers? I'm, I'm, I'm a technology guy, can I meet your developers? No. <laughs> no publishing the developers, not on the website, every developer is hidden. <laughs> but that just shows me that there is an underlying pool of talent, that companies are afraid that other companies will steal these developers. And when you have a deep dive, you realize that these are not PHP or SQL developers. Blockchain, artificial intelligence, machine learning, AR, VR, this is the tool of the pool, pool of talent that exists in Bulgaria. These are the fundamental technological building block that will drive the technological future. And they're, yes, they're all across the Balkans, but they are mainly here in Bulgaria. I see a place that the World Bank chose to position its only IT hub outside of DC. And there was a lot of political work behind that. I'm aware of that. But the decision eventually was made due to the superior infrastructure that exists in Bulgaria. You frog leaped the copper into the best, fastest, most stable internet in Europe. I don't know if you ever visited Germany lately in 2022 <laughs> and try to, you know, I, I go back to the dial-up modems like whenever I try to connect to the internet in 2022 in the so-called, you know, biggest economy in, in Europe, while the poorest economy has the <laughs> most stable infrastructure. And it's that infrastructure you need to build new economic models on. Stop thinking about Leva versus Euro. Both of these systems are old. We need to rethink the economy using the tools we actually have. So how do we shout it out? How do we bring it out? How do we rebrand Bulgaria? And, and there are years or years of depression and inferiority complex due to geopolitical situation in Bulgaria. I'm dyslectic, dysgraphic, and I have a minor case of OCD, and when I say minor case, my wife always corrects me, it's absolutely not minor. You can ask, <laughs> you can see the mark on the fridge at our place that it's not minor. Okay. They discovered that when I was 17. Until then, I was just lazy, or, which makes me that old if they discovered that one only when I was 17. Not a single teacher came to me and says, hey, Eric, you know, uh, Having dyslexia, dysgraphica, and, and having an OCD is not a disability. You can use it for your advantage. Having an OCD made me a perfectionist. Yes, I, I don't let go, not of the fridge door, not of the car door, but I don't let go of projects before I know they're ready to go. So OCD made me a perfectionist. Being a dyslectic enabled me to step back and see things from a distance, because I cannot read letters until today. I memorize the shape of words, but I cannot memorize from a distance because word is a part of a sentence. I need to stay back. That made me an architect. I'm able to understand patterns. I'm able to see how things connect to each other, how things build together. That led me to become a futurist. So not every disability is a disadvantage. You know, Keith Jarrett, one of the greatest jazz pianists that ever lived, uh, was invited in 1973 or 1975 to Cologne Opera House in Germany to play a concert in the Opera House. And when he's coming to the stage, the great teacher, Gerard, discovered that the piano on the stage is broken. And number one, it was the only piano, talking about the greatest economy, the only piano. It was not a grand piano, it was a baby grand for an Opera House. Um, the pedals? were broken, none of them worked. Some of the black keys got stuck, and on top of everything, the piano was not tuned. And he sits in front of that, and he's saying like, how can I be Kid Gerard in front using this, you know, broken piano? And he decided to improvise on the spot. He worked 
he worked his music around the broken elements of the piano. And he produced a completely new tune, something that no one ever heard before on the jazz stage. Until today, it's the most sold solo jazz album in history. And it's even called Key Gerard on a Broken Piano. <laughs> now, if Bulgaria is so broken that the world is saying it, and if Key Gerard can do it on a goddamn baby piano, imagine what we can do with Bulgaria if we start work around the limitation against, instead against the limitations. Everyone will tell you, think outside the box, <laughs> right? We need to think outside the box, but let's be honest. They have been saying it for the past 12 years. There are so many more people outside the box than in the box. It's more crowded <laughs> there. I mean, it is what it is. It's time to rethink the box. It's time to rethink Bulgaria. And this is how you rethink Bulgaria. With an empty page. With a new slate. This is for you to fill up your idea, your wishes, your needs, your wants. We have to invest in innovation and education because without these two, nothing else matters. And it starts with innovation because education is already fucked up. So we need, <laughs> we need that to change that. It is, that's it. We have to invest in value-driven invention. Three of the top SpaceX engineers are Bulgarians. How many IPs Bulgaria has on space technologies? Yeah, maybe free. We have to start registering intellectual properties in Bulgaria. And when I say that, and I say that over and over when I talk to university, I'm getting like, ah, the system doesn't work, I know. This is why we started H359, Horizon 359, and I really hope you understand 359. And if you don't, it's the prefix, prefix code for the country you live in. Yes. And the idea is to create an organization which try new crazy things. We just launched a call for action for two programs, one of them around innovation and technology transfer, where we are going to see how we can re-establish Bulgarian agriculture and farming, bypassing the limitations that the legal system from the EU is putting in front of that. How we can use solar panels to produce hydrogen and water for vertical farms, for circular urban farming. We are going to do a project with kids within the music industry, innovation with the music industry. Think about a kid that gets 40, one teacher with 40 kids today. What happens when you put a digital twin in between them? How, how will the learning curve of a child is going to look like? We are going to uh, organize a, an innovation ultra running next year for 359 kilometers. And if that is too short for you, you can join me on my 50th birthday, which I'm planning to do 500 in Bulgaria in five days, not at once, in five days. Okay? And we live in a world that is full of storytellers. Everyone has a story to tell. And when you tell these stories, you realize socialism failed, communism, well, you know that that failed. Capitalism doesn't do us very good. Maybe it's time for Bulgaria to make a new story, a story that is driven by a new governance model, innovationism. And if we do that, Bulgaria will step from being a storyteller of telling other people's story to become a story maker. Thank you.